thank you everybody for coming here today. I see some familiar faces and some that I don't know, but that's a good thing because this uh, presentation here is designed to uh, let you folks know about our processes in the building department for the city of Bloomfield Hills. And uh, also we wanna hear some of your challenges and concerns towards the end. So what we're gonna do is I have a few things to talk about here, some introductions, and then we'll have our planners do a presentation and our, uh, our engineers do a presentation. We'll try to keep this about an hour and a half, hopefully hour and a half, two hours. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just get this thing going. Everybody's busy. Um, so start with some introductions. I noticed the mayor is here today and I wanna introduce uh, and, and, and appreciate uh, Mayor Alice Buckley for coming here. She's in the back, so thank you, Mayor. We appreciate that. Um, and I'll just go through a couple, a few introductions here uh, so uh, I'm Dave Hendrickson, the city manager. My job really is to make sure the whole team works together. And uh, in the different processes, we're always trying to improve things. So my job is to try to always improve things to make sure you guys have an easy process to get through um, so you're prepared for the various boards and commissions. And also my job is to make sure our staff has all the tools they need. Amy Burton, assistant city manager and city clerk. Is, is the gatekeeper for all those projects that have to go in from the front of the boards and commissions. So before they do, Amy scrutinizes them all after even the plan, after even our consultants look at it. So we have all the information available. Um, Brian Bargason is our building official. Many of you know Brian. And you'll deal with Brian after you, get, after you obtain your permit. But Brian's job is to keep that project moving. And at the end, to make sure that that project complies with uh, all of our commission um, uh, motions and approvals and, and, and all the necessary inspections for uh, the building approvals. John Rogers here is our code enforcement officer. He pays close attention to the uh, building sites for any code violations. And John's gonna talk a little bit uh, later about what he looks for. Because uh, we wanna keep you folks out of trouble and we don't want any extra aggravation and ultimately, we want the residents to be happy that these projects are moving along with the least amount of disruption as possible. Kristen Urbanic is our building clerk. She manages the building permit process. And she does another important thing. She monitors our consultant review. So we have a Google shared document. It's kind of interesting. This is how maybe tightly we manage this, is uh, we have the shared document that we watch how each project goes through. And if she notices that there's something wrong, uh, maybe there's some sort of bottleneck, maybe it's our fault, maybe it's a consultant, maybe it's applica applicant's fault, she identifies those things. And we try to find out a solution and move the process through. Uh, Jennifer West is our administrative specialist. She's not here today, but she manages our escrow process. We'll talk about that escrow process a little bit. And she works with applicants uh, uh, primarily in a communication uh, She's a, kind of a middle person with the communication, so there's complete transparency. And so how we do it is we, um, we disseminate information between Jennifer. Uh, the consultants give us the, the, the review, or I should back up, the applicants uh, complete their package that they, they uh, submit, and we give it to the consultants, and the consultants review it, give it back to Jennifer, and we give it back to you folks. And so, uh, she's an uh, intricate part of all that. Uh, Morgan Tisler is not here today, I don't think, is she? Morgan? She probably had to stay back. She's uh, our finance uh, um, clerk and, and building support. Dirk Barkerleg is our city attorney, and uh, Dirk's sit sitting up front here. Dirk's, Dirk assists, assists us with uh, any legal analysis we need. Now, we count on the uh, consultants to understand our ordinances but um, there are times when we need some clarity, we call to Dirk for that clarity. Jill Bame uh, and Eric Peach are our uh, planners from Giffels Webster, and they're in the back there today. They're gonna do a little presentation in a minute. Um, they review our projects for uh, compliance and our for, uh, from our planning and zoning ordinances. And then, our, then we have our engineers here from HRC. They've been our engineers for 50 years. They know our ordinances pretty well, and I think they're gonna, what's gonna be helpful today for you folks is they're gonna identify some of the issues that they see, um, and they're common, like common denials. And uh, so I asked them to, to, do, to do some work on that. And so why are we here? 
Um, yeah. Why are we here? So there's a little statement up there of why we're here. Um, well, really what it means is our job is to help you folks get through the process. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get the actual project you want, or the applicants or the homeowners will get actually what they want, but you should be well prepared to go in front of a board commission. And that's really what our objective is. So sometimes that gets a little skewed. We're not necessarily, we don't necessarily have an opinion of how, you know, all these projects are absolutely beautiful. Gorgeous, big, huge projects. But it's not really our opinion on, on if they're really adding value to the community. Our, our position as a staff and consultants yeah. is that you're following the ordinances and you're getting yourself ready to go in front of a board commission if you want a variance or some sort of concession. And um, so that's really initially, this is why we're here, because we want to make sure that you understand that. And so I had a few things that, that we've done in, in, the, in the past few years to talk about. We really digitize everything within the office. So no more bringing big, huge plans all the time. We do everything electronically, which is really nice. Um, we can do everything online. We pay for things online. We fill out, you can fill out your permits online. You can schedule inspections online. We have all our detailed uh, checklists. And those checklists might not even be part of the ordinance, but those checklists are really important because those checklists were developed uh, for, from our experience from going in front of the different commissions and boards to understand what they're looking for. And so all that, all those things, including our ordinances, can all be found online. Um, and including this little presentation here will be online. And we plan to do this every year. Um, let's see here. So I talked about checklists or pre-construction meetings. That's something that we require now, our pre-construction meetings. These projects are very complicated. And uh, Brian and John uh, are responsible for meeting with you folks over these projects. And it's really kind of designed so that you understand our expectations. They really kind of stay out of trouble. You know, understand what John's looking for, what Brian's looking for, how we can minimize disruption to, to our, our residents. Building in Bloomfield is kind of a perpetual thing. I mean, I don't think there's, I don't know if there's many lots left, and now there's homes being taken down, but it just seems to never stop. And so you can imagine if you lived here, it can be disruptive. And so we want to minimize that disruption. And uh, one of the ways that we do that, just have kind of a clear understanding of each other's positions. And I, we think that over the last several years, that's really kind of helped us and helped actually the contractors. And what really helps the contractors uh, and design staff is the folks in here that I recognize um, are the ones that understand this. And it's, we, we see that folks coming into this community and starting off and trying to work through our ordinances and build these projects do have some difficulty. And so it's exciting for me to see the folks that we know, but it's, it's even more exciting for me to see the folks that I don't know. So we hope to continue this on to, uh, to help everybody uh, with that understanding. There's a couple important things to know about that we've changed in the last uh, couple years is that our permits expire after six months. Now we used to have it as a year, but the reason why we do this is because we had quite a backlog of open permits and expired permits and we wanted to, to kind of really understand and, and, and monitor all our open permits and projects. And this really has worked for us. So it's an ordin our ordinance states that the permits can't be extended without the permission of the city manager. So what I required um, Brian to do and what he will, what some of you folks have probably already experienced is that he has to approach you with a plan of of completion and so what that does is it, it lets us know where you were in the process uh, when you originally apply for your permit you have to have a timeline and Brian will evaluate what you've done in the last six months there's a lot of projects that, that takes that take two years but we really don't want a project that's supposed to take two years to take three or four years because again it's all about you know being um, uh, you know being uh, causing the least disruption as possible, being considerate, being considerate of, of, of the community and, and all the residents. So, so what Brian does is, uh, he'll talk about that maybe a little bit more, but uh, 
they'll make sure that you have a plan moving forward. Our ordinance says that you have to diligently uh, work on your projects and get them done. And that kind of ties into uh, the next thing that we've, we've somewhat changed. Well, let's see here. Is uh, our applications expire after 90 days. So, so no longer are the days that we have piles of applications and piles of open permits sitting under the front counter. Uh, we call people, let them know if their permit's ready, and or their uh, we, we ask them what they're doing with their application. But after 90 days, oh, we cancel those. And so you have to come back in and start the process all over again. It's really designed because we just want to make sure everything is moving forward. Um, we don't like things lingering. We have a really good control. We know exactly what everything, what's going on with everything. And once we, and what that does is helps us identify problems quickly. And then once we identify the problem, we come up with solutions. It only helps you folks to get your projects done. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Well, escrow management. So we'll talk a little bit more about escrow management probably uh, in the presentation. But I just want everybody to know that most people probably know us, but we're a small community and we rely on consultants to do our planning and engineering and our, uh, and our city attorney. So they are not full-time staff. So those folks um, have to charge for their services. And so what we do is we, we establish an escrow account and it's a pass-through. The city takes no administrative costs. All we do is pass that cost through back to you, but we still are really, um, for me, I'm really, I'm always really concerned if there's a necessary cost with our consultants, and so we actually, with our processes, we have a way that we identify um, process or projects that aren't moving along very well and, and are getting continued uh, reviews. And so, if we see that there's more than two reviews on a project for one consultant or another, that'll that'll set off an alarm for us, and we'll either call. The applicants, or have maybe a phone conference, or find out what's going on, because the last thing we want is our is our residents or our land uh, property owners to be paying for you know continued consult reviews because somehow the communication isn't working. So we're always trying to improve that communication. Um, so that's why we have to establish an escrow account, and that's why we have to uh, um, to uh, to fund it uh, after it starts to. Uh, Diminished, and we and we set out monthly statements. So we're working on a process right now. It's uh, to send out a monthly statement, um, uh, you know, automatically. So, so. the only last thing I want to say before we get into the engine or the the, um, the planning part, it's just again, is to talk about what our roles and responsibilities are. And so, it's city administration and consultants are. You know, we're here to manage the applications, approvals of building projects uh, in accordance with the standards, uh, ordinance standards, and the policies. Our policies are always being improved. But really, you know, one of the things that, that was important to me to have everybody here is that you have a responsibility too. So you as an applicant or the design team or applicants team have a responsibility to make sure that you um, understand what our expectations are. Make sure that you fill out these forms completely. We do have new uh, systems in place online when you're filling out forms and it prevents you from going any further. So we're not left in a position where we, we're having incomplete applications. Um, but one of the things that I, I, I find sometimes, especially with folks that are new to the community, is that they don't always take the advice or of our consultants. And um, so I, I, I uh, I ask that you do so because they've been through this. They understand what will, what it will take for you to be successful in a meeting, uh, in a board commission meeting, and when you're in a board commission meeting, listen to the to the commissioners or the or the board members because they're, they were they're going to give you information that's going to be helpful, and we'll we'll document that information. We're always going to provide it to you, but sometimes I see um, situations where folks aren't ready in those meetings to make adjustments to kind of move on your you know. Think on your feet and uh, move your position, and that could be really helpful for you to get your project moving forward. And not get a table, so that's really all. I just wanted to uh, say hi and introduce everybody, and then uh, I think Eric, if you uh, come up and.
Sergeant Brock, part of this? Okay, so as I said, I'm Eric Peach with Giffels Webster. I'm here with my lead planner, Jill Bame. Um, so as I stated, if there's any questions on the material that we're going to go through today, uh, afterwards, I'd be happy to talk with you, uh, give you a business card, um, create a relationship. Um, as Dave said, um, the idea is to um, help you through the process in Bloomfield Hills, which um, you know is a unique community and, and may not be um, similar to other uh, communities that you'd be working in. So. Uh, without further ado, we'll dive right in. Um, the presentation that I have before you is to um, go through a lot of the main issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of the phone calls that we receive, uh, a lot of the um, types of review items that create issues um, that slow down the process for getting to approval. First and foremost, uh, this is our landscape open space plan and analysis. Um, this is found on the city's website uh, under forms. What we're trying to do here is determine whether or not what's being proposed is going to exceed the open space requirements. Um, to break it down, uh, we first and foremost need the uh, overall square footage of the lot. If we don't have this on the form or if it's not shown or presented in the plans, then I can't do an analysis to confirm the numbers that are presented before me. So. Um, a lot of the time, not a lot of the time, but sometimes if that number's not there, then I have to incomplete the plans right off the bat. So it's important to have the overall lot square footage. Um, all calculations are based on that. Each item contains a number and should be shown on the open space diagram. So even for simple projects, just like a patio edition, um, it's always good to show the lot layout because each one of the numbers um, on the analysis form are associated with a component on the plan. So whether that be the primary structure, walkways, driveways, um, or accessory structures and buildings, uh, we need to know and have a breakdown of what's existing in terms of lot coverage, and then the yellow column, the change in square footage for what's being proposed. So it sounds simple, but a lot of the times if we don't have a clear layout of the numbers um, to verify the open space uh, the open space of the lot after the proposed improvements. Then it can be tricky. Um, like I said, a, a relatively simple um, process could be complicated uh, if we don't have all the numbers. So to have this up front when an application is received um, just helps us through the process much more efficiently um, right off the bat. So I know that there's a lot going on here with colors. Um, my mind is set up um, to help color code things, to help me flow through um, information more easily. So don't be afraid of, of um, the colors on this screen. Just an update, the box on the bottom of the screen. Um, we, we need to update these, um, the application form or the analysis form to reflect the idea that all walkways are uh, exempt. So. The area of the or the analysis form in yellow, that's where you want to identify your exemptions because if you don't include that, you could potentially be over in terms of your coverage. We need to be able to factor out the exemptions that are permitted um, within the analysis. So uh, if there's any questions on this going forward, we'd be happy to answer those uh, afterwards. Uh, in terms of um, accessory structures, uh, the first item we'd like to cover is fences. So this is what keeps us really busy in Bloomfield Hills is because when a fence is proposed, they're permitted um, in the rear yard uh, administratively, but once they hit the side yard, and in some cases a front yard, uh, they require planning commission approval. So the intention of this, this slide is to give you an idea of the layout of, in this case, a corner lot, um, the three different scenarios that we have. So do we have a pointer? You know. um, on the right-hand side of the screen in blue, that's the side yard of the corner lot. And then on the north side uh, as well, the two blue segments are the side yard fence uh, locations. And then in the corner there, you can see that there's a rear yard, the, the fence identified in pink. And then the red portion uh, is within what's considered the front yard along the street that fronts the property that's not the primary access point, which is allowed 
by way of planning commission approval, but be prepared to explain the reasons why uh, a fence is, is proposed in that location, because my first question to you is going to be what justifies it being there. Um, and so we'll have a discussion to try and determine if that portion of the fence in the front yard can be pushed back um, to the side yard location. And if not, then we'd go before the Planning Commission to justify and present evidence of why it would remain in the front yard. So the point, purpose of this So the intention of this slide is to show you and demonstrate what's not quite ready for planning commission. Any fence that's ever in a side yard is required to have screening. So that goes with the front yard fences as well. So if this was what was received in terms of the plan to go before the planning commission, we don't have what's the basic of what's required. Um, here. As you can see, the fence that was in the front yard has shifted to the side yard, which again, both scenarios are, in a sense, okay, but this is what's more preferred. Um, the screening that's surrounding the side yard fence segments um, will be considered by the Planning Commission whether or not it's sufficient uh, to serve its purpose, which is screening from both street rights of way and adjacent properties. So given that the Planning Commission has the authority to approve the screening, they would also perhaps consider that you extend the screening to the rear yard fence as well. Um, if this was just a, a plan for a rear yard fence, this doesn't go before the Planning Commission and it's not necessarily required that the fence be screened back there. Um, however, in Bloomfield Hills, screening is a, a really important um, characteristic of the community uh, and uh, the more exposure that you have in Bloomfield Hills, you'll know that one of the um, primary focuses is to maintain and uphold the character of the community. So moving on to building height, uh, this diagram is actually in the ordinance. Um, this is to explain the building height of the different types of roof styles. Um, and so reading through the definition uh, of building height shall mean the vertical distance measured from grade to the highest point of the roof surface for flat roofs and to the deck line of mansard roofs uh, and to the average height between eaves and ridge for gable, hip, and gambrel roofs. So to take an example, um, a lot of the times I'll hear, Eric, where is the building height shown in the ordinance, or where is it explained in the ordinance, what I need to do in order to demonstrate and show that our proposed structure doesn't exceed 30 feet. So it's a little bit tricky in the sense that the first go-to is within the definitions of the ordinance. And in fact, most of the information comes from the definitions in the ordinance. So grade shall mean a ground elevation established for the purpose of regulating number of stories and the height of buildings. So grading has a lot to do with the whole exercise of determining whether or not the proposed structure is reviewed to comply with the 30-foot maximum height limit. Uh, building grade sorry. The building grade shall be the level of the ground adjacent to the walls of the building if the finished grade is level. So easy concept to, um, to be mindful of. If the, if the ground is flat, then it's just a simple measurement from that surface to the midpoint of uh, the roof, the highest roof. If the ground is not entirely level, then that's where things start to get tricky and we start to spend some time together in pre-submittal meetings, uh, going through the data and the analysis of um, determining, uh, computing the average elevation. So we'll just touch the surface of that here. We can talk about it more afterwards. Um, but for all intents and purposes, so if, if you were to apply, apply a grade that sloped and not level, then the calculation is what kind of throws people off. And so while this may not show exactly how to do this, at least hopefully the approach to getting the concept will, will start to settle in. So using this um, schematic as an example of building height, if you were to consider the existing grade that it slopes and drops, then when you take the calculation for the elevation of, of, of land around the building, that's going to drop 
your average grade from a flat surface. So that's what's being represented here, that the same building that we saw on a flat grade, taking this exact same building and the dimensions of it and applying it to a surface that sloped, the average grade calculation is going to drop where you're taking your vertical measurements from. And so what was a building height of 27 feet on a flat surface is now the same exact building on a slope surface of 31 feet. And so it no longer meets the requirement for a 30 foot uh, height limitation. So the height for building, maximum building height, comes from the schedule of regulations in uh, section 196, and that's the maximum building height shown here. So in all of the residential districts, the A, uh, A, A1 through A, A6, the height limit is 30 feet, and then there's associated a um, subsection Y, which reads, for the purpose of determining building height when a new established grade is two or more feet higher than the existing natural ground grade, the measurement shall be taken from the existing natural ground grade. So what that's saying is if you're filling the ground to create a level surface, you can take height measurements from the new grade up to the two foot mark. So if you're filling up to two feet, then your measurements can be taken that one foot or up to that second foot when calculating your average grade. So it'll help keep the average higher than dropping it. But once, once you fill more than two feet, then you have to go and take your height calculation to the existing grade. I don't know if that makes sense, but we can go through that a little bit more later. Um, same thing with cuts. When you cut uh, a piece of property, um, the measurements for taking cuts, you always have to go with the new, um, the new proposed grade. So what does that look like in terms of an analysis and what we would expect to find on a set of plans? This was the best example that I felt um, kind of showed how that might work. So with this exist or proposed building in the back, if you were to imagine all of this information taken away and all we were looking at was this existing grade, which is this brown line here, we want to know how a proposed building would fit on a lot that slopes like that. So when, when you incorporate the, the building onto the site, there's going to be some cuts. The, uh, proposed grade is this dark green line here, shown to be at uh, 809, uh, contour line of 809. So to take the existing grade, you would be cutting this amount here in yellow, which is approximately 1 feet 6 inches. Uh, at this point here, these are different segments of the building that we're taking measurements from. So I know it's probably hard to fully wrap your mind around the concept of what's happening, but there's different segments of the building that we're measuring the grade around the perimeter. So here we do cuts. At this point, we're starting to fill in order to achieve the new um, proposed grade. So the fill up to two feet is where you can take measurements um, for height up until that two feet mark. Um, but once you go beyond that, um, you have to take your measurements from the existing grade. So we're good up until this point here, but once you surpass this, then this area here is what's going to drop your average grade. So your measurement now, instead of being taken to prove the building's 30 feet from the proposed grade, it's going to dip to where this green line is represented. Um, and as you can see here, the average grade is identified as 802. So it went from 809 of the proposed grade to the existing or to the average grade of 802. So it's from this line that you're going to be making your height dimension of 30 feet. Uh, this is an example of taking those different segments of the building and calculating the distance of the segment multiplied by the elevation. So once you've calculated all those different segments. Um, you'll divide by the number of, of points, and that should equal the perimeter of the building. So we're only looking at all the changes that are being made around the perimeter of the building. Um, 
So this concept is one of the main hiccups, if you will, uh, for when we receive like a new home that's on um, elevation that's not flat. So we have to spend some time to go through this exercise. So hopefully this information makes sense in terms of its graphic material um, that you can study or look at. Um, by all means, I'll give my business card afterwards so that if you do have a project that is um, proposed on slope property, then we can uh, connect and, and go through that process with you. Moving on to yard determinations. Uh, when I receive a new application, I like to go through the yard determination first and foremost. It helps me um, and my confidence in knowing that what I'm reviewing, whether it's um, a permitted fence in the rear yard or a side yard fence, if I do the yard analysis first, then I'm not spending time later trying to determine whether or not this is the right application to be um, received. So simple case is your um, typical uh, rectangular lot uh, with the house on it. Let's say they're proposing a fence in the backyard. That would essentially be a uh, permit request um, to which I would review and deem it to be acceptable and move forward. A lot of the lots in Bloomfield Hills are not rectangular. Um, this one, as an example, is on a corner lot. So the idea would be that if I, as the property owner, wanted to handle my own permitting, and I'm putting a fence and a pool in my, what I would consider the backyard behind the house, that I would think, oh, I'm just putting a fence and accessory structure in my rear yard, when in fact that's not um, the case in this, in, in this example. So um, with the yard determination, we are able to determine that the pool and the fence are actually proposed in the side yard and that automatically means that that's a planning commission application from the city staff and a planning commission application for review. So added on top of that we have the required yards um, which is determined by the minimum setback requirements per the ordinance. So for example if the pool hypothetically speaking was behind this blue line, which is the required yard or the minimum setback of the side yard, then that's not permitted and obviously would require um, approval from the zoning board. But before getting to that point, we would obviously work with you beforehand um, to try and find ways to comply with that. Fences, on the other hand, can encroach into the, um, into the required yard. Um, but for screening purposes, we'd like, we typically like to have a little bit of an offset from the property line just so that you can achieve uh, the type of landscape screening that uh, would be required of you. The last concept for discussion, um, for my presentation anyways, uh, is also one that uh, takes a lot of our time with each application. And I know some of you in here, we spent a lot of time um, with this concept. And this is uh, a calculated setback or an algebraic formula that's in addition to the minimum setback requirements uh, outlined in the ordinance. So the idea behind it is to identify the height of buildings and structures and the length of structures so that if placed in close proximity to property lines, there won't be an an obstructive presence, a massing of a structure in close proximity to a neighbor, for example. And so the idea that is that if you step back your height and your, and your length and you reduce the length, that a, the structure that's proposed would be more in compliance with, uh, with this concept. So what does that look like? Where do we go in the ordinance? Again, we're back to the um, schedule of regulations in section 196, more particular V. Um, this only applies to main buildings, so if you have an existing lot that's proposing a pool house, for example, this whole exercise would not apply to that. It's just, if for a new house or an addition to an existing house, this is where you would um, reference the ordinance for the calculated setback. So notice that uh, um, districts A5 and A6, they do not have a V associated with them, uh, so they're not subject to the calculated uh, setback analysis. So these are, the next few slides are just some examples of what this might look like in terms of how you should prepare your plans to demonstrate whether or not um, your, set, your calculated setbacks comply or not. So 
the red line here is the analysis that we're going to determine whether or not this structure complies with. So line A, we call them test lines. Um, so test line A, you want to determine the length of it as it passes through the structure. And every test line that you're, you're incorporating is parallel to the property line that you're testing from. So A, the, the formula should, demonstrates that there's a 30 foot height through this section of the building and the length of the line is 103.78 feet. So I probably should have put the formula uh, here's the formula, L plus 2H divided by 2. Um, 2 is always the denominator in the equation, so there's always a question in the ordinance because it's not explicitly stated, um, but for your purposes, uh, if doing residential, um, it's always a divisor of 2. So um, plugging those numbers into the equation, for test line A, the required setback um, per the formula is 81.89 feet. So when I was learning this process initially, I had my aha moment when it was determined that we need to have the distance, the dimension from the property line to the line that you're testing. So for both A and B, once those are provided, that's what tells you whether or not you're in compliance or not. So test line A requires a setback for that part of the house at 81.89 feet. So it's likely that based on the dimensions of this um, schematic that that's going to pass. But you'll need to tell us, the applicant's responsible for telling us what that setback is because that's, that determines whether or not you're in compliance. Same with B. So applying the height of 30 feet, the length of 28.64, um, results in a setback requirement of 44.32 feet to that line. So if that's more than 44.32, then, then you're good. Same concept for your side uh, property lines. Um, using this as the example, this is where, without reviewing for the um, calculated setback, I would have a thought that this would probably be the part of the building that would have the most issues, if any at all. Just because it's in close proximity, um, there's more of a length of the line that's adjacent to the, the property line. Um, and depending on whether or not the height was tall or not, this section of the building is where I would focus most of my review attention. Um, you know, as it relates to the front line, this is probably going to pass just because it's such a significant uh, distance. And then same for the rear. So even if you have a situation where you're designing a lot, um, home for a lot, it's best to provide the calculated setback for all property lines. Even if it is an excessive one, at least give one um, test, just so that we can verify that you're in the clear for that. Especially as it relates to um, sections of the building that are in close proximity to the property line, we'll definitely want to make sure that there's no issues with the calculated setback. So I also get questions a lot um, pertaining to building height as it relates to obviously the maximum um, height limit of 30 feet and then the building height as it relates to the calculated setback formula which are two different things because considering what I said about the maximum building height having everything to do with the average grade um, determination the uh, calculated setback building height is based off of the existing grade or the proposed grade. So it, it is, in fact, everything that is established with the home um, based on the actual grade. So you'd be making your average height analysis um, based on the slope that you find here and then, of course, the easier scenario where it's a flat surface to determine your average height for the, for the formula. So with that, the planning perspective, the planning review of things, we are very much um, interrelated with the, engine, the city engineers' reviews of grading and um, everything engineering related. Uh, so um, I will pass the mic to Leah with HRC. Um, and again, if there's any questions, be happy to meet afterwards and, and continue the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Can everybody hear okay in the back? Okay, I was sitting back there, I had a little difficulty. 
A lot of stuff's a little complicated, but the whole idea of having all this is that it's going to be online, and you, and you can review it and talk to Eric later. But let us know if you can't hear. We, we uh, want to make sure everybody hears it. Okay. Thanks, Leah. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Leah Michaels with Hubble, Roth, and Clark, and we're here to kind of go through some of the engineering items, uh, various things that we see throughout the process. And um, as Eric and Dave said, our goal here is really to help everybody get through this review process as efficiently as possible. So what we're going to do is kind of point out some of the issues and items that we see uh, most frequently. Um, in an effort to make sure everybody knows about those and we can kind of resolve those up front. So the grading uh, plan review process, um, really detailed grading plans are required for almost all projects um, in the city that involve uh, design professionals. Uh, any new single family homes, modifications to the homes, um, anything from grading and filling, clearing, um, construction of landscaping berms, uh, a lot of pretty much all development projects will require these uh, grading plans. Um, the only thing that doesn't is if you are doing a new fence, um, but that still requires a topographic survey and a site plan to show where that fence is going. And rarely in the city do we see just fence projects. They often come with pools or other type of work being done as well. Uh, so on this presentation, we're going to go through our grading ordinance checklist, um, and you all have a copy of that. We can also provide copies if you ever uh, need those. But this is really uh, the review process that we go through, so we want to make sure everybody has that information and kind of a checklist um, that you can also go through as you're preparing those plans. Uh, the bullets in this checklist really come directly from the ordinance. So they are all the items that we are enforcing. Uh, there's different sections on this checklist. The first one being plan specifications. We have grading, drainage, and we'll see all the other items that the engineering review focuses on. Uh, we want to point out the plan specification section. Uh, that's really the basics of what needs to be provided on every plan. Uh, and we want to encourage you to kind of go through this checklist and just make sure all those items are there. Uh, if any of those items are missing, that immediately takes us into another review. So these are just standard things that are required on all the plans that we just want to make sure are getting there so we don't have to um, spend time going through multiple reviews uh, just to get some of those items. Uh, so as we move through... Uh, as we move through, we have st structure information, utilities, um, right away, and different items. Okay. Uh, so something to point out on this slide is that not all projects will require right away permits. Uh, that's kind of limited to the area in the right away, which we um, don't see those on all projects. We just see them on projects that have like private drainage work within the right-of-way or additional driveways and stuff like that. But um, So right-of-way doesn't really apply to all projects, but it is something that we look through. Uh, we have the tree and woodlands preservation and protection section, which is required on all projects, as well as soil erosion. Um, any earth disturbance work within the city does require soil erosion and sedimentation control. Uh, so you have that checklist, and like I said, we can provide that to anyone if you're interested um, in getting a copy of that, too. But what we're going to kind of go through next is just some of the common issues and give some examples of uh, various things that we see on plans. Um, and the one thing we really want to stress is that the ordinance does require design improvements that fit and respect the existing site conditions. So we really want to stress that in Bloomfield Hills, we want the projects to be designed to the site. We don't want the site to be designed to the project. Um, so the city uh, is really interested in keeping the natural beauty, the trees, um, the way the current topography is. So when we see projects come through, we really look to make sure that it's being designed to fit the current site, um, which gets into 
the idea that mass grading is not allowed uh, in the city. Uh, we don't want it to be affecting all the trees and the natural beauty of the land. So we really want grading to be limited to what is really necessary for the project that's being applied for. So the main components of the site plan are listed. Um, all of them, we need existing topo, proposed grading, building elevations, private and public utilities, including any service leads, um, any existing and proposed drainage pattern and systems, and then the soil erosion. Um, and one thing to know about the grading plans is that they are through final landscaping. So when we see these grading plans, we wanna make sure they uh, account for any final landscaping that will be done on the property. So if you do need additional topsoil or sod um, or mulch, uh, that these grading plans and these elevations that are pro proposed really reflect any of the landscaping work that will be done also. So the proposed grading plans really need to be final when the whole project is complete. So just to point out a couple items that are commonly missing from plans, um, and again, these are just things that automatically will get denied and have to go through an, a second review. So just kind of providing some checklists to make sure all of this information is on the submittal. Uh, your proposed grading contours, public and private utility leads, uh, property descriptions and benchmarks, retaining wall information, and soil erosion. Um, those are kind of things that we see over and over again that are just missing from the plan. So we just want to stress that those are um, simple things that uh, we just want to make sure are shown on all the plans. Um, the next thing is some common non-compliance plan items, so some things that require a little more review that we see. Um, and this is fills or cuts in excess of two feet. So uh, as most of you know, if you have that proposed on a project, you will result in going to planning commission. Uh, forced walkouts, which goes back to the earlier discussion of really building the home to fit the site and not modifying the site and the grading to kind of force a walkout um, on a home. Uh, retaining walls in excess of three feet, that's something else that requires planning commission approval. Um, so that's something we want to make sure everybody's paying attention to and trying to come up with designs to kind of mitigate that instead of doing a six foot wall, doing a two, three foot walls, a more tiered approach, um, looking at ways to kind of get around uh, needing to ask for approval for over a, a three foot wall. And then the other thing is mass grading, um, which you'll hear from me a lot, but it's really uh, has to do with impacting the trees, impacting the natural beauty of these sites. So mass grading just is not something um, we allow in the city. And it's really to preserve the natural area and um, what the community has. So I'll go through just a couple of site plan examples um, just to give you an idea. Some of these things we're talking about, uh, this is a, a typical site plan that would get submitted, but it's really missing all the topographics um, information. So in our grading section, we really can't review any of those items. So um, just to reinforce that we need one foot uh, contours of all the existing grading and all the proposed, um, and, and really every project needs a site plan with topo um, and just more detailed information. Um, back to the mass grading item, this is uh, a sample of everything in yellow is planning to be graded, uh, where the green items are the only things that are remaining. Um, so really this is not allowed in the, in the city and uh, we just want to stress like the importance of not pushing the scope beyond what is really needed for whatever impro improvements are being proposed or any drainage um, improvements that are needed. needed. Um, expanding the area to impact landscaping is not permitted, um, nor is kind of grading the site, removing all the existing vegetation and trees. So we like to review the grading and make sure uh, mass grading isn't proposed and it's really the only grading that's being done is really what's needed for the project at hand. Uh, the next item to talk about is utilities. Uh, so a common thing we see is um, for water service leads, the minimum in the city is one and a half inches. Uh, sometimes we'll see these called out as one inch. Uh, that's 
that doesn't meet the minimum and uh, really we want to encourage everyone to um, be as thorough as possible when it comes to these utilities uh, especially with a lot of the sizes of the homes and the properties within the city a lot of them do need a two inch water service lead uh, just to make sure there's adequate water pressure so um, we want to be careful in what we see is being proposed on these projects that they really do accommodate the project and the size of the home for sanitary service lead, the minimum size is four inch. Um, any new construction or rebuild does require water and sanitary sewer um, capital connection permits. And while we're talking about this, um, the city does reserve the right to require the applicant to provide public easements um, over any existing or proposed utilities. So that is something we look for um, during this plan and something that may be required. Another sample here is about the retaining walls. So um, the retaining walls, when we get as built and when we get plans, we really need to see spot grades for these to confirm that the walls are indeed under the three foot limit. Uh, just adding a note that the wall will be built to three feet is not sufficient, um, especially on as built plans. We do need to see the elevation difference so we can confirm that they are indeed um, three foot. And then just, I guess, thinking about, I guess, the terrorist approach and how to get around doing anything larger than three feet. Um, working through your design to make it match the character of the property um, without installing these massive walls. Uh, so this slide's just to show you um, kind of the important notes that we need to have on all the plans and then that the contractor actually needs to follow these two. So um, we request a sequence of construction, um, soil erosion notes, tree protection notes. So um, this is kind of just to give you an example of what is required on the plans and what is required as far as um, tree protection and soil erosion for all the projects during design and then also um, during construction. So kind of as Eric mentioned, um, you know, the grading ordinance and the zoning ordinance really are interrelated. As far as building heights, grading, setbacks, uh, any revision to one often impacts the other. Uh, so we want to make sure everybody's getting both the reviews from planning and engineering um, and looking at them as a complete project because when you make modifications to address uh, one of the planning issues, it often impacts um, what the engineering review is as well. Similarly with landscape open space, natural features, those uh, can also be impacted. And a, a building permit is not released until you get approval from all the departments. So we just want to make sure um, we're all kind of working together and all of our, our reviews are, are working together to, to make a, a complete successful project. Uh, road preservation bonds may also be required. Uh, that really depends on the potential impacts to the roads. And uh, we just ensure that restoration is, meets the city specifications when the project's complete. Uh, for those that are seeking grading variances, uh, we do require that you provide an exhibit that clearly defines this request. Um, a lot of you have seen ours. Uh, we can provide samples um, if anyone has it and you want some other ideas on how these need to look. But whenever a grading variance does go to the Planning Commission, uh, we need a nice colored exhibit so everyone can really understand the impacts. Uh, so the fills are typically shown in one color and the cuts in another and then um, different shades showing the varying amounts of cut and fill. So it's important for us to see how much is kind of in the two to three foot range versus how much is in the nine to 10 foot range. Uh, Cause that really does matter when it comes to approvals and um, being in front of the command, planning commission. They really need to understand what the request is, what the magnitude of the request is and, and kind of the areas it is. So we do require all the applicants provide this if you are going to planning commission. Um, and like I said, we can pro provide other examples or kind of um, if you need help preparing those. So a couple of tips um, just to kind of shorten the review process for the engineers. Again, our goal is to make this process as efficient and po as possible um, and, and get through the review so that you can move on to planning commission or move on to building your project. Um, so um, we always are open to having a pre-application meeting scheduled, which that goes through the city. 
Uh, Giffels always has their office hours, but the engineers are also willing to come and meet with you and talk about any engineering concerns you see or anticipate for the project. Um, make sure you're always submitting to the city, um, and not just through HRC. Uh, just kind of helps smooth that process along as well. Uh, you'll always get a, a review submittal checklist, so we encourage you to look through that before submitting um, and after just to check to make sure all those points are being addressed. Um, and if we do go through a second review, it's helpful if we get letters stating what's changed or clearly show on the plans. Again, that just helps us uh, be quicker with our reviews and kind of move through the process a little smoother. So any information you can provide to us um, to say how these comments were addressed. If, it just helps to limit our time spent on these jobs. Um, and then just make sure to resubmit complete plan sets and not just the revised sheets, because uh, we do need to see how the whole project works together with anything, any revisions that are made. Uh, as we get into construction, I'll touch on the little things, but I know Brian and John will touch more on it. Um, but the foundation certificate plan requirements, uh, we do look at those after the foundation is constructed and prior to backfill. So I just want to point out that the plans need to show survey grade of the foundation walls, uh, finished floor elevations. Uh, they need to tie down the dimensions showing where the building is located per the approved plan. Uh, so rough framing of the structure can't begin until the cer certification has been approved. So um, the more complete plans we get, again, the smoother that process can go. Uh, so we've kind of noted a couple of issues that come up during construction as it relates to engineering items. Um, sometimes we see deviations from the improved plans, and we really want to discourage that. We want to make sure the design really accounts for everything and the project is built per the plans. Um, if new walls are added, grading beyond the approved plan is done, um, that does result in possibly having go to go back to planning commission for approval or could really result in having to actually remove that item that is violated. So um, we just want to stress the importance of making sure the project is built to whatever the plans were. Uh, so we come in again to review the as-built uh, plans. So the as-built requirements fall in line with uh, the grading, the initial grading plan requirements. So again, making sure everything um, is shown on that plan. And the more complete as-builts we can get, again, the smoother the process can go, the faster we can get our review done, um, and you can get your certificate of occupancy. So, um, again, it's helpful to have that like checklist just to make sure everything is in, included in those ads built plans. Uh, another item that engineering looks at is the natural feature setback. So structures improvements are prohibited within 25 feet of a natural feature. Uh, those include streams, creeks, rivers, lakes, ponds, wetlands. Um, anything, any work that's proposed in the area does require planning commission approval does require a full set of plans, um, does require submittals. Even something like putting a fire pit within the natural feature set black requires all, all of these same uh, plans and topo and such. Um, and then just something to keep in mind, if you are proposing anything in those areas, uh, the city prefers for it to be natural materials and plantings um, for that. Uh, and then my last item, again, goes back to soil erosion, uh, that it is required on all projects. The city does administer their own soil erosion program, uh, so there are no permits needed from Oakland County or Eagle. Uh, it's all handled through the city. Uh, we have someone that goes out and does these inspections uh, periodically, so we want to stress the importance of making sure you're following up with your soil erosion, that it's staying throughout construction. Uh, similarly, at the same time, we also look at the t tree protection measures, and those, off those get inspected as well. So making sure all those notes that we talked about putting on the plans um, actually do get implemented, and we, will, we do inspect on those. So with that, I will turn it over to Brian, who will talk about the building permits. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. My name is Brian Vargas, and I'm the city building official for Bloomfield Hills. 
My building permit is approved, what's next? We've moved to a pre-construction meeting, John and I, the code enforcement officer, and we felt it was a time for, uh, to go over the project, um, some of the do's and don'ts um, of what to do in Bloomfield Hills. So thus far, um, some of the builders in the audience have went through this and it's uh, been very successful. So we're gonna continue with that. Uh, any changes to the approved plan? I, I can't stress enough to the builders, uh, contractors in, in the audience to uh, submit new plans. Um, don't take it upon yourself to uh, make that call. Um, you're just most likely going to read down or go down a road of disaster there. So if you could resubmit chain or you know updated plans, we can take a look at it, our consultants, and then we can move forward. Yeah. The city manager Dave Hendrickson uh, stated our permits are good for six months. Um, at that time, when your permit is expired, you're going to be receiving a letter from myself to supply me with an updated schedule in order to get your permit extended. Um, I don't want to chase you guys around. You get the letter. Chrissy's available. I'm available. We need to get the schedule over so we can have uh, city manager sign it and get you guys extended so you can move forward. Preliminary foundation as built as Leah went over. Very important, foundations in, get your as built in before framing so we can get them approved and keep you guys, uh, keep you guys going. Final as built and certificate of occupancy. Again, I cannot stress to the audience, uh, the builders, the contractors, we need to get those final as built in. We cannot move any further until those are approved by HRC. And then we can move into either a temporary or a final certificate of occupancy. Along with that, we need a company to a certificate of occupancy application uh, so Chrissy can do her part to prepare to get your C of O ready. So I want to thank you, everybody. Dave, how do you switch that down? Still one more slide. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm John Rogers. I'm the code enforcement officer for the city. Uh, been here about five years. I have a law enforcement background, but uh, after retirement, uh, Dave was nice enough to uh, take me on. Uh, great retirement job. I really enjoy it. And I've got to work a lot with HRC and Giffels and Brian. I've learned a heck of a lot. So. Um, but in the end, I guess I'm sort of the bad guy. And uh, if there's any problems at these sites, it's gonna be my face you'll see, so I guess get used to it. But um, you know, with construction site management, in the end it might sound hokey, but it really is a quality of life for our residents. Um, a lot of beautiful homes, pay a lot of high taxes, they expect a little bit of service from us. So um, there's gonna be disruption, we understand that. There's gonna be sites, a lot of materials, a lot of uh, equipment but we just try to keep that to a minimum if we can. Uh, the basic things here, uh, I know the builders, the architects, the landscape architects all want to put their sign out there, get their name out there. That's fine. Uh, 12 square feet's the max for a sign, but the main thing, if you guys have ever driven around Bluefield Hills, you've got to notice one thing. Every sign in that city is black and gold, every one. And that's cut and dry. It's non-negotiable, those signs, a black background, gold lettering, gold numbers for a telephone number. Um, and believe it or not, we enforce it. We do. It's not just, it's not just lip service. So um, 
Uh, majority of my complaints, construction parking. Uh, biggest thing, we cannot have one vehicle on the roadway at, at any time, anywhere. Every, uh, you know, your, your tradesmen, all their trucks, cars have to be parked on the site. If you got a million guys out there, you're probably just going to have to find a uh, parking lot along Woodward, double the guys up in the truck and bring them to the site because um, this will be enforced also. And um, there's a couple, uh, couple of reasons for that. You got to remember, there's no sidewalks in this city. So what do we got? We got people running, walking, biking, jogging up and down those streets. You got vehicles parked along these uh, sites. It's a little bit of a danger. And these roads are small. They can barely fit two cars going each way. You can't get a fire truck down those roads either in case of an emergency. So no vehicles on the roadway. Um, another important one, work hours, pretty simple. Monday through Friday, 7 to 5. Saturdays, 9 to 5. No Sundays, no holidays. Um, by holidays, the bank holidays are fine, but you know, no 4th of July, Christmas, anything that falls during the week. So. Um, Another big one, uh, tree protection. Any trees that remain on that site, uh, we want to protect it. And it's not just, uh, again, just for people to drive by and see around the trunk. It's got to be that entire drip line. So to protect the roots from, uh, you know, mostly from the heavy equipment. Uh, we enforce that one uh, all the time too. It's, it's one of our pet peeves. Uh, the city really loves the trees, so. Uh, silt fence. Again, that's not just, uh, again, just to look pretty. We want it to work. If you got to move it, you know, to get some uh, equipment on site, put it back, make sure it's operable. Any big rains, last thing we want is mud in those streets or uh, running off to a neighbor's property. Uh, also for a, a, a mud map, we want one of those established before the job starts. A good 25 to 30 feet uh, onto the site, usually 21 AA will do the trick. Just keeps the, uh, the mud off the uh, vehicle wheels. Uh, this might sound uh, minor, but uh, it's a blight issue. Obviously, again, there's going to be disruption. There's going to be dust, dirt. We understand that. If you can keep the weeds down to a minimum, it's appreciated. Uh, again, the, the residents get it. They're going to see these sites sometimes for three years. If you can just keep the weeds to a minimum, keep those sites as tidy as you can, it makes everyone a little bit happier. Uh, everyone knows you submit a road bond. And what we do, um, I'll take pictures before that project starts of the entire road in front of that, uh, that lot, if you will. And we'll do the condition. And, and if at the end of this uh, project there's some damaged roads, we're going to take it from that. might take all the bond, but we're probably going to take a portion to get that road fixed. Um, uh, 18 month site stabilization. I know this doesn't happen everywhere. It's big in our city. What we expect is hopefully within a year and a half you've got the outside of that house done. It's brick, it's blocked, whatever you got going on. Obviously there might be a pool or a cabana house going, but at the end of 18 months, we want that uh, site stabilized, meaning like a, a hay blanket or anything like that, just to keep the dirt and the dust down. People have been looking at it for again 18 months, it just makes things a little easier on the eyes for the residents. Zero tolerance of working without a permit. That's more for renovations, what we run into, a lot of roofers. Um, they don't pull permits. They figure to get that job done in a day or two, and we, you know, we won't be, uh, won't see them. Or maybe on a weekend. But you got that and uh, interior renovation. So what Brian and I look for, obviously, we see a dumpster, a driveway, or three pickup trucks or work vans. We're gonna knock on the door. If we find out they don't have a permit, zero tolerance. They'll get a ticket. And normally, it's gonna be the contractor and the resident. They'll both get them. Uh, last but not least, public safety enforcement. Brian and I, uh, of course, day shift hours, if you will, uh, no weekends, but just remember, uh, public safety is out there 24-7, and if we don't get the calls, they will, and again, they take 100% enforcement action also. But that's really about it. So thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Brian, and thank you, uh, Eric, and, uh, and, and thank you, Leah. So I think we, we did what we, what we planned to do is uh, to kind of give you a kind of a brief overview and talk about what our process that our processes are and our responsibilities and also yours. And hopefully you got some good tips out of this. So what, what we want to do now is uh, some Q&A, some, some questions and answers if you have any. 
we could, you guys can always call our consultants or you can call our staff if you don't feel like asking those questions now. But what we're going to do is we're going to have a representative from HRC, Jamie Burt, come on up here. Uh, Brian, come up here. And uh, Eric and uh, Dirk, also our attorney. Uh, if you wouldn't mind sit, sitting up here. And if anybody has any specific questions for them, we'd be happy to answer them at this time. Not for my tool. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, Mike, do I, I have an administrative question. Um, as it relates to the escrow account management, um, you mentioned that you, that you sent monthly statements mm -hmm. to the account. Do those go only to the owners or to the installers as well? I think it goes up. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Chrissy. But you can answer. Go to the So there's an amendment that um, allows for walkways that are strictly uh, intended for walkways. So, you know, whether that's three feet or five feet, but once the site plan shows that potentially you could lounge or put up chairs um, on what would be considered the walkway, then we would, we would consider that to be um, um, space that has to be calculated against the open space. So it's only up to 30% of the, um, the uh, landscaped open space percentage. So you'd have to know what the size of the property is in order to make that determination, but it's only up to 30% of the landscaped open space amount. A question to Tian, right? Yeah. It's a great question, but we are right in the middle of working on yeah. it. So, so uh, last month, uh, or this this month, we uh, presented some opportunities for ordinance amendments because we saw what you saw, which was we would go to planning commission and there would be a, a request for additional stormwater measures on the site. Uh, and uh, with great feedback from the city commissioners, we are, are putting next month or may at the latest an ordinance amendment, which just talks a little bit more in the ordinance about uh, volume control maintenance of those items. But the, the grading ordinance as it stands allows the ability for the city to request, require, um, updated, you know, improved drainage, especially when you're changing the drainage pattern from front to back, back to front. We had some of those homes in the past where uh, accessory structures that may have got a setback, but the downstream system, we knew there was a problem. So those are what you've seen in the past. Um, we are not headed towards a perfect, you know, uh, 10,000 square foot house here's a pond. We do not want ponds everywhere in the city either, and then that affects the trees, the grading, and all those other items. What we are headed towards is this ordinance amendment is more discretion and more push for ensuring a reasonable protection for downstream properties, okay? And whether that's, um, we're hoping not necessarily ponds, but bile swales, rain gardens that can be shallow, or infiltration, if you have the right soils, infiltration basins, leaching basins, et cetera, for some of that offsite to do some mitigation. So it is going to be on a case-by-case -case basis because every drainage outlet is different. Every drainage outlet has different parameters, constraints, concerns. Some subdivisions, for example, that have been built in the last few years have stormwater management built in already, right? So those, so we couldn't find, there's not a one-size-fits-all. So we've left it to kind of a discretionary item. But we are pushing more towards mitigating the cumulative impact, not just one home with an addition, but the 
every home with addition. Every house that comes in Bloomfield Hills is getting bigger. Everyone's looking at motor courts and sport courts and patios. And it's just the cumulative effect is going to create drainage problems within the city. And so we are trying to mitigate that moving forward. I don't have a... There's not a calculation or a formula yet, Tian, or anyone else in here, but we are going to start requiring some mitigation measures. The planning commission and the aesthetics of this community, the trees, the, the, mass, the lack of mass grading, the et cetera, ponds, we don't want ponds everywhere, um, are going to come into effect. So we're going to have to look, be creative and try to blend that into the landscapes that you are proposing uh, to the extent possible. And no, we don't want trade-offs for a little bit of stormwater management with 10 trees lost. Okay, uh, trees and screening are probably going to take a little bit of priority, but we want to see some creative ideas to mitigate that. Definitely, when you're into you know open space, parcel splits, things like that, you're going to see that more and more common. If you buy you know the open space variances and stuff like that, you will see more requirements for that. Well, I think it depends. Uh, you know, I think what you're talking about, really, you have, to, you have to look at the totality of what you're doing, the trees on the property. Maybe there's a, a I never wanted to advocate for removing a tree, but it depends what the, what the uh, condition of the tree is and what your, your uh, proposal is, I would think. But that, that in, in particular is, uh, could be a landscape open space issue because I think that that is the product you're talking about. From a, I'll start from a grading perspective. Um, we encourage you to try to use lands, you know, short, dry stack retaining walls to want to do a few things. Is to limit the amount of grading to get back to grade as soon as possible, so you're not mass grading, right? Keep it tight, keep it down, and also to preserve that tree. And I don't think we meant that for it there'd be a ten foot hard number, but we've seen in plenty of times where people are going three feet from the. Th and, you know, I'm going to protect this tree, here's my wall, and you're just going to cut all the roots and you're going to kill the tree anyways. So that's really going to be up to the landscape architecture to say, this wall, this, we can save this tree, this is a reasonable spot. It may have to be, lo it may have to be bigger than that, than 10 feet. That 10 foot is about the tree protection, but if you say, look, I'm going to try to save this tree, I want to save this tree with a retaining wall or grading to limit my grading and tree loss, then we would work with you on making sure that's an appropriate spot. If you haven't got it already, we want you to save as many trees as possible. And if, if that hasn't become totally evident, uh, and, and minimize your grading. So if retaining walls can do that, we're willing to work with you on that within that time, that within those constraints. I saw that as more of a grading issue than a tree issue.
So probably the best way to answer that really is it really is about what our ordinance requires. And we really, you know, everybody up here really doesn't have a necessarily opinion about that. We have to follow what the ordinance requires. And um, I get what you're saying. We have these questions all the time. But there's, per, there's, there's reasons for it. And these guys are much better uh, equipped to answer those, those reasons. But it, it, whatever you're doing, um, and this is kind of the idea of this, the, whatever you're doing with any project in our city, we want you to understand what the ordinance requirement is. is we are the people that have to make sure those things are followed. Get uh, maybe some better reasons for that. I know Jamie can probably yep. comment. It, so I think I think the ordinance, the grading ordinance, where a lot of the stuff you just mentioned is in, I believe it allows for the provisions for a professional engineer, professional survey, or a landscape architect to sign off on those on those drawings. So that's in the if that's in the ordinance. To Dave's point, that's uh, that's what we want to want to see. Um, they got to be the real grades. So whether you need a survey or you know. I, if it's super complex, we typically won't go. Well, the landscape architect's not good enough for this one. Um, but most, we've not really seen, you know, a, a brand new house on a complicated lot just try to do all the site work under landscape architecture. We've seen that be survey and engineering. Um, you know, easements and things need to be, you know, through surveys or engineers. Um, but, you know, small patios and stuff like that, if the ordinance allows for the landscape architect, it's got to have a sign and seal on it. We want that professional. Uh, the professional statement, and I think the ordinance allows all three, um, uh, in, in, especially for the smaller ones, I think landscape architects appropriate. You get into massive big stuff, then I think you guys have generally punted to engineers or surveyors to do that work as well. It has to be signed and sealed by the professional. I think that's three of them. Even within our ordinance, there, are, there is a provision with our ordinance that even for minor grading, there, the, the, that the administration can waive some of these. So you know, maybe, my comment was, Jamie understands it much more thoroughly, but my comment I would do is go back to the ordinance. And uh, I just know that there are sometimes when the administration can make some things, um, there are times when the administration and the building official can waive a couple things. Uh, and so, you know, there are, some, there, there are some things that we can waive. But we won't waive things that are our ordinance requirements. Be a, be a question for Brian. It's a really yeah. cool question. Yeah, I have. Oh. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, is it Tian back there? Yeah, yeah. Come up with that question. <laughs> uh, why don't I give you a call on that one? <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. I was going to say it was a planning question, but all right, I'll start. Um, the, the landscape open space ordinance, I believe, generally speaks to pervious versus impervious surfaces, right? And, uh, and as we all know, everyone in the room knows that that's not necessarily a yes or no question. There's, there's scales of pervious and imperviousness, right? And so we've tried to look at all of those as simply more or less the 50% kind of rule, more or less pervious versus impervious. Um, I've seen on the, some, on the artificial, on some on the artificial turf, um, 
it's 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 really permeable. It's super permeable. But then you're just collecting it on top of essentially a liner and piping it right piping it right out the side of the patio. That does that's not that's not impervious. That's not going away, right? So under drains, we like to see them because that will help get the water away. But if it's just going to get caught right on top of the clay that's beneath it and just run right off, right? We've kind of said no. That's we've got to we got to treat that more as impermeable surface and therefore it counts. Um, We've had a, several conversations, Planning Commission and City Commission, about that definition. But as of now, we're kind of doing more or less uh, and we're looking at some of the, the opportunities beneath it. If you've got a nice sandy site or, or you show your soil borings from your foundation, if you've got a nice sandy site and you're not, it's just going underneath, then, it's, then we would treat it as a pervious surface and not count it. We then turn that over from a lot coverage. You know, uh, it's, you know, it's better than pavement, but it's still... Something like sport courts, the tiles, you know, right, that kind of go through. Those tiles are great. I would call those pervious, but you put them on just a normal clay lot in Bloomfield Hill. They're not, they're not, the water's still going to be, the, the water's still going to run away. And from the, from the top down, I always call the bird's eye view, it looks like a, it looks like a impervious surface, right? I mean, you got purple tiles, black and gold tiles, whatever they are. So we've kind of devi- we've looked at those too. Like if it looks from the surface like it's, grass and open space and it is draining such that it is, then we usually will count it as pervious. But if it's, you know, you know an asphalt, a, a pervious asphalt, it's not really, per, you know, it, it looks, it, it violates the intent of the, of the land space, open space requirement. So we get a lot of those questions. That's how we've been dealing with it until such time as we come up with a, a direct so standard. Yeah, I, I would call it the 50%. If it's more pervious than impervious, based on all those things, then we call it we call it down the middle, kind of more or less. Yeah, I, I don't think per, I don't think pervious pavement is, from an engineering perspective, it's great. It's a great stormwater management tool. Um, it's not less. If you take the 50% rule, right? Just draw two lines, you know, on the scale. It's not less than grass, right, or, or whatever. But it also depends on what you're doing underneath it and where it's going in the water. That's, it's, a, it's a system. It's just not a surface. But from the top, from a landscape open space requirement, and this is the conversation we've had, if you look down on that lot, it looks like a, you can't tell. And so if you're going to try to use pervious asphalt to go away from the open space requirement, we're going to say, wait a minute, this is, this is no different. You know what I mean? It's that, it violates the original intent. So, but we have... So I'm trying to answer that directly. We go more or less, call it the 50% rule. So just to follow up on that question. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, yes. Yeah. And, and I think I'll, I'll go a step further. If you're right at your threshold of you've crammed all sorts of things in, and this is what's going to put you over the top, right? This it's going to be different than you've got a nice spot and you've got a little grass, you got a little grass area up, up up near your patio that you want to you want to keep manicured or something. I think you know the scale of the the variance or the scale of the waivers you're looking for matters, right? And so if it's a smaller little area that's not going to impact anything, it's different than this pushes you. This is the only way you can build what you want under the ordinance. Then we do we will look at that a little harder and more. Oh yeah. I think that's important. Yeah. So as it relates to my first um, few slides uh, related to the landscaped open space and the form, and hopefully the idea that it's a relatively straightforward analysis uh, in terms of making uh, the percentage calculations. Uh, any surface that's improved, whether it's permeable or impervious, permeable or impervious, um, is considered coverage, and so it would act against you in terms of filling out the the analysis form. So. The ordinance is clear uh, when it talks about exemptions, and so that's the importance of knowing what the exemptions are, and that's the certain dimensions of the, the driveway, which is the shortest distance from the street to the, to the garage doors, uh, and as well as the, um, 
the, the walkways on the property. So, you know, if it's if the arguments made that while well, we are over in our uh, coverage, but we have all of this um, this permeable area, so like a sports court, for example, unfortunately we have to consider it as coverage, and so it it. it reduces your open space and whether or not that's something that you can proceed uh, as, as a variance uh, would be considered by the, the ZBA um, for that, that overage and coverage. But again, the exemptions are simply stated in the ordinance as being the driveway and the, and the walkways. So, Yes, sir. The question is what defines a walkway, and so it's, it's to an extent it's to our discretion, and so I believe there's a uh, language in the ordinance that explains that we have a certain amount of ability to make that determination as the reviewer. Um, and so again, if it's determined that it looks like it's a place for sitting and for something more than just getting from, for example, the driveway to the front door or to the side door, then I would calculate that into your, your coverage analysis. So for an example, yeah, so you're questioning what's the limitation or, uh, you know, what's the threshold. And so, for example, you know, you have this home that has a grandiose uh, entryway with stairs, you know, steps leading up to the front door that exceed eight feet, say they're 10 feet. And then the walkway that leads up to it from the driveway for a short distance. My interpretation of that would be that that's a walkway, that you're not going to lounge in that short distance that may be more than five feet, for example. So that's where I would use my discretion to say that that's, that could be factored into your um, exemption, so long as I don't see any other um, instances on the site plan that may take advantage of that type of leniency. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. So the simple answer from the planning perspective in terms of, as it relates to filling out the landscaped open space form, it counts against you. So if it's not natural grass, then you calculate that, you factor that into your coverage. I'll let... So it would not be counted as natural... Right, it's not open space. You'd have to count that against you in your coverage, yep. Lots, but you'd be surprised in what big projects go on these lots and start taking up all the space. And what essentially what happens is some of the things that we're talking about is that there's a water issue. And Dion asked about you know some mitigation of what, what's coming, so we're working with the commission on that, uh, and that will probably end up with uh, we're going to be talking to you about how you could improve these things, and maybe that little hard fast things in an ordinance right now. But really, this, this conversation gets to all this more and more stuff on these properties, creating a, a, a water uh, mitigation issue. So that's how I think the city's 
accountable greater. That's, that's difficult. You know, there is more and more stuff, but 80% of the say with these large homes is difficult to obtain. Well, there are, it depends on the zoning Well, it's a lot of percent. I hear what you're saying, but um, I think really it, it goes back to keeping the character. And the more stuff you put on property, the more trees you can't remove, the more adjustments to grades, the more times you're going to be in front of these boards and commissions asking for forgiveness or asking for uh, some exceptions to the to, you know, grading ordinance. And I suppose that we're trying to minimize that. I hear what you're saying, but I think that the, uh, the goal is an admirable one for the city. Because in the, at, at the end of the day, it keeps the character of the city and it keeps the people that want to be here enjoying their property and enjoying what they see around them. Sure. I'm going to the same conversation with on coverage the open You would much rather natural world fills be worth me. We're doing a great job. Thought that it so low away from So it's kind of a darkness, hard built element of that against us. Good question, but what you're what you're saying is very simple. So, um, you know, you're, you're, you're making a comment in general terms, but um, but that property, whatever you're talking about, is very subjective. So that's why we do rely on, on our experts to kind of, you know, pick apart everything. And, and there may be times where having that retaining wall is better because it, it's going to hold some grading back uh, that will protect a couple trees, you know, a little further away from that, that wall. So I, I get what you're saying, um, but I think that's where the, the, the uh, the open dis the discussion between the consultants and the, you know, the collaborative work together to find the best solution works. And we usually do find a good solution. But I guess in general, right, um, we're meeting with the client for the first time. We're trying to put together a generalized budget. And we know that doing a little bit still It doesn't impact. Less than that. So here's one thing I forgot to mention. Here's one great thing that we do. We have a a, a office a free office hour meeting once a month. So for conceptual things that you may be talking about, the best thing that anybody can do is come into that meeting, and Eric's usually there, and, and Remington's usually there from HRC, and you can discuss all those things. You can have give a preliminary plan, and they're going to talk to you about things from the ordinance perspective, and you know about uh, from a master plan perspective too, and keeping the character of the city. And I think that will give you a, that, that it's really hard to answer your question here. I get what you're saying. But that is something that we, we have, I think, that has a lot of value. So then you can take that information back to your client, make some decisions, and, and then fill out an application, submit. Uh, our team reviews everything, talks to you, and go back and forth a couple of times, and then the next thing you know, you're doing something. So the first part of my question is We, we've had 
rock slopes. So not a retaining wall or leads, leads rock wall, right? Eric, you wouldn't count. But we've had people come in with big rock slopes on, in, 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 you know, that's a, that's a different conversation. No. No, yeah, right. we don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. So once a month, um, you probably know right now when an expert uh, does anybody, does anybody, does anybody do you know? Third Thursday of the month, you can call our office, talk to Jennifer West. I don't have the date. Uh, I think her number is uh, 248-530-1405. And then you can schedule that. They, they, they fill pretty quickly, but I can tell you a lot of people get a lot of value out of this. Anybody else have any questions? Well, I really greatly appreciate this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I hope we're helpful, and rest. please call us if we can help you with any further. And uh, if you have our packet, this is going to be online. This presentation is going to be online. And we'll continue to do this every year. We'll let you uh, try to keep everybody informed, too, about any awareness changes that we have. Thank you.